on, I stop sharing. Um, let me uh, go our um, next, you know, speaker. Um, um, I think as a part of continuing our discussion about ARDS and just to follow that aspect, Dr. Um, Ali Zayed, he's a consultant pulmonologist and critical care uh, from Mayo Clinic Healthcare System. He's going to tell us about uh, prone ventilation in COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Samani Fadiak? No, I'm so well. Okay, Salam Alaikum, uh, Ali Zayed. Uh, the theme. Well, uh, next topic is going to be, um, you know, prone ventilation and ARDS in general. And we'll talk some steps in the back um, and at the end about COVID 19, something relevant. So, this is the outline. Uh, we will get like some uh, physiological effect of prone position, talk about the efficacy with a landmark study of PERCEVA trial. What are the contraindications? Exactly some tips about the procedure and how to perform it and some common complication that um, you should look for and hopefully you can prevent. And then a uh, final couple slides about um, something specific to COVID-19. And I'll try to answer the questions that were asked about prone uh, ventilation in those patients. So uh, this is just a summary, you know, uh, you know, my colleagues talked about this multiple times and during different sessions, but ARDS is very common under-treated and under-recognized in the ICU in general. This is the Berlin definition, which uh, Fadi have already touched base on. And this is a nice summary of uh, ARDS management that was published just before the pandemic started. And it talks about the stepwise approach. And um, you know, the topic that we're gonna discuss today is prone ventilation. And these are the risky therapies that we use on people who are failing you know, lung protective ventilation from paralytics, prone, and um, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, or ECMO. So um, the difference in the, the, um, the physiological effects and why prone works is, is that uh, we know that when you are on the supine position, there is some ventri the uh, anterior alveolus are over distended because the posterior alveolus are collapsed and most of the tidal volume is going to a baby lung here. So when you flip people prone, you can see that the anterior um, um, you know, alveoli, they are less distended and you open the posterior alveoli and that's usually recruit more lungs. And as you do so, the ventilation become more homogenous. And uh, the second thing that is also important is that there's zones in the lung that determines the perfusion. So zone one is the apex, apex where there is more ventilation than perfusion. Zone three is the base where there is more perfusion than ventilation. And once you flip people prone, you lose this gravitational effect and therefore you, 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 know, you, you improve perfusion. Some of it also this improved perfusion is because of um, increased cardiac output that um, happened because there's a loss of uh, hypoxic vasoconstriction in the lungs, which improve RV um, uh, afterload. So in general, what you end up getting is that an improvement in ventilation and improvement in perfusion, which results in better oxygenation. At the same time, when you flip people and um, you know uh, prone, the heart displaces kind of anteriorly away from the lung, and at the same time, the diaphragm drops, and that's usually improve uh, the compliance of the lungs and can decrease sometimes the plateau pressures that we may be running high when we're ventilating those patients. So the um, a landmark study that did take into um, that put prone into the guidelines of treating ARDS is the PERCEVA trial. It was a prospective multi-center randomized control trial in Spain and France. What they took is they took patients with severe ARDS. Uh, they defined them as a PF ratio less than 150, uh, a peep of at, on at least a PEEP of five and a FiO2 of 60%. And they were ventilated with a low tidal volumes, like 6 ml per kg. And what they did is they randomized them to either prone position for at least 16 hours or supine position. And they looked at all cause mortality at 28 days. And this is the big exclusion criteria that they had. And this is actually serves as the contraindications for proning. 
So this is what we use generally to say this patient is or is not a candidate. So intracerebral pressure about 30 or cerebral perfusion uh, pressure less than 60, someone who has persistent shock, someone with acute bleeding or polytrauma, um, tracheal surgery and sternotomy within the last um, uh, two days, uh, or sorry, within the last two weeks, spine instability, and there are some relative contraindications from uh, recent DVT, uh, one recent means within two days, the same thing for recent pacemaker within two days, uh, an anterior chest tube, um, major abdominal surgery, and severe burns. And this is what you can see, it's a very lengthy exclusion criteria, uh, which sometimes limit the uh, generalizability of this uh, study. Like it doesn't apply to all your patients because most of the ICU patients will have some of those, um, um, at least relative, if not absolute contraindications to proning. So, um, what they did is when did they decide to stop the prone treatment? And this is actually what we use also about when do you stop? And it's either when it's working, so there was an improved in oxygenation, so you were able to get um, the PF ratio above 150 and P less than 10 and an FI2 less than 60%. And they met, said that they, they determined that you need to meet those numbers by at least four hours after you were flipped back to supine. Or it didn't work, so people have a drop by more than 20% in PF ratio when you flip them, so it's not working, so you put them back. And if there was any major complications, and um, those could be divided into um, an airway problems from unscheduled extubation, um, main stem intubation, or um, ET tube uh, obstruction, uh, if there was hemoptysis, there is significant hypoxemia or significant cardiac instability. Uh, as we will talk later, transient hypoxemia and transient arrhythmias and hypertension is common, but that's usually just transient and over the next few minutes, once you prone them, they, it will usually um, um, you know, get better. Uh, and we'll talk about how you can uh, try to avoid those complications as much as possible when you do them. These are the kind of the results, and you can see that there is a clear separation between the prune and supine uh, group. And if you look at the adjusted um, um, odds ratio, there is a very you know there's a highly significant improvement in mortality. The absolute risk reduction for mortality is around 17 percent, which usually results in a number needed to treat of around six patients. And what that means is like if you take patients with the severe RDS and prone them, you need to prone six people to save one life, which is a very good number, and um, it will improve mortality. And as Fadi touched base on it, it's also, it did show that in uh, people with um, COVID-19. So the limitation of this study was, is that because of the lengthy exclusion criteria, this is only applicable to a very selected group of patients. So it doesn't apply to everyone who's coming to the unit. And to look at, at you know, some of those numbers, uh, they have to screen around 1,400 patients, and they only included 400. So, the meme that Marda Likano went to the ICU with ARDS, they didn't qualify for this. Um, and despite the randomization, the groups were not matched. Uh, people prone had more paralytics, people on supine had higher SOFA score, which is a sequential organ failure assessment score, and they received also more vasopressors. So there was no perfect matching between them, which can also some explain uh, those results. And um, this study was done in 2013, and at that time, the ARTS network trial were already published, and it's been in the, in, in the guidelines. So when they randomized those people, uh, patients were having lower PEEP um, than what is according to the ARTS network. So their FI2 maybe was high, and if you go by the tables, you need to put them on a higher PEEP. On this study, PEEP, um, PEEP was not as high as the um, ARTS network tables. So those are some of the limitations. So you take this results with a grain of salt, but it's one of these uh, trials that did prove um, significant mortality benefit for those patients. There's a lot of previous trials that did improve oxygenation, but did not result in mortality benefit. 
And this is a, a meta-analysis from uh, Cochrane database. And this is, you know, looked at all these studies for um, uh, prone ventilation and ARDS. And this first um, uh, outcome was mortality. And there is a, you know, there's a trend towards mortality. It doesn't reach kind of statistical significant, but it does clinically significant. And when you take the subgroups to determine which one actually works better, so you can see it works better if you prone people for at least 16 hours. It works better if you um, uh, do proning within 48 hours when the people meets those criteria. So earlier, the better. And it does also work when people have very bad or severe hypoxemia. So they, you know, you, you know, not that much for mild or moderate. Uh, and that's why the cutoff for proning that we, most people use is around a PF ratio of less than 150. And mainly based on this kind of trial that we talked about just previously. So, talking about like now to the kind of practical side of this, um, how to do it, how to prepare, how, you know, all of these kinds of things, because this is probably something, you know, جديد على ICF الأردن. وفي كثير خوف من محاولة إن الواحد يعمل proning بس بالتدريب and take your time uh, you'll be able to do it and um, with time you'll become very efficient and you'll prone people like um, uh, very appropriately so the first step in preparation is you know you need to talk about the timing so when to do it and زي ما حكينا قبل إنه earlier is better so you need, so firstly, when someone presents with you with this ARDS, you try within 24 hours to stabilize them from low tide of ventilation, you work on everything, giving all the right medication. And then after that 24 hour period, you decide whether the patient's improved and he's not requiring that much or the patient's still sick. And therefore, let's think about proning those patients. You're gonna have to check for contraindications. Uh, you know, as you know, we use the exclusion criteria from that study to look for um, contraindications. And then one one uh, pr practical aspect is you need to do any necessary procedures. So the um, you know, if you need a central line for drips for IV access, you probably need to put it before you prone the people. Uh, the same thing if there's any nursing intervention like oral care, suctioning, wound dressing, ostomy back change. You need also to get to take care of those before you prone people. Uh, you're going to also, you know, educate the family, you know, because this is going to be something that if if um, if they see and they're not aware of is like they, they're not going to understand what's going on. So family education is a very, um, you know, effective tool and initially just to let them know while you're preparing for it. Uh, we do confirm the ETT position to be at least two to four centimeters from the carina. And the goal is to prevent, you know, main stem um, um, intubation if it's very low or unscheduled extubation if it's very high. Um, you inspect and confirm all the lines, tubes, drains. Make sure that they are, you know, secured very well, very good, so that uh, nothing comes, um, you know, um, nothing gets loose. It's not like when you prone them, there is no sedation or there is no drip. So uh, just take your time to make sure that all of those are very secure. We typically stop any internal feedings if someone is. You check for residuals, and if they are high, you actually do NG suctioning. So you empty the stomach to prevent any aspiration or vomiting that can happen once you flip people prone. Um, you do ensure also there is an adequate level of sedation. So you usually, typically, people shoot for a RAS score of minus five. Also, you ensure adequate paralysis because you don't want them to be moving or maybe inadvertently, like um, respond to you um, stimulating them, so that that can result in um, um, dislodgement of an AT tube or drip. So usually, you made a certain train of four uh, goals. Most of those patients usually are paralyzed by now because you know we know that. Paralytics are used for ARDS, and, um, and that's why sometimes, you know, people are already on paralytics, but if they're not, we give them a one-time dose of, um, you know, paralytics that usually will last for at least, like, you know, um, 45 to 90 minutes, and that, um, uh, and that will cover the whole period um, once you flip them. 
whether you're going to continue that after that's a, you know, that's going to be a preference and there's pros and cons to all of this uh, once you use them. And I'll talk a little bit briefly about it uh, later on. Um, and then you pre-oxygenate them. So you put them 100% and the goal is to prevent any transient hypoxemia that may happen, at least initially. And then once you prone them and you put them on 100%, then you will check an ABG and based on that, you can drop down on the FI2 according to the numbers. But it does take a lot of uh, preparation and that's just to make sure that everything goes smoothly and there is no major complication that can happen. So you need to take your time uh, to prepare everything to make sure everything is good. Training on a mannequin is very good um, to kind of help people be used to this and not the first time that they perform it on a real patient. And this is what we actually did with our nursing. You know, we used to uh, prone people even before the um, um, COVID-19 and we're having actually a very uh, robust kind of proning um, team, but, um, you know, as numbers grow, you need to prone more people and you need to train more nurses to this and training on a mannequin was very helpful for them, um, uh, at least during the preparation um, part for this you know, uh, COVID-19 pandemic back in March. Now, the actual procedure, how to flip them is not standardized. There's nothing that can tell you you have to do one, two, three, four. The best uh, local resource who uh, uh, Jamaat al Amaliyat, and in nursing with anesthesia, they prone people every day, the uh, spine surgeries. So they do it like, every, um, you know, every day. And, um, you, know, um, you know, technique, you can modify it to work with the critically ill patients in the ICU. But a lot of times those people, they have the knowledge, the capabilities, the tools uh, to look for it. And at the same time, uh, they know how to prevent complications from pressure source and other stuff. So um, involve them with your discussion, learn from them, um, yeah, and it's going to help uh, quite a bit. Um, how many people are needed? Um, you know, somewhere between three and six, typically. Can you prone people with three? Yes. And actually, there's a video that I'll put a link for from the same uh, French group that did the study. And they were proning people. They were proning people with just three providers, but that will depends on you know how sick the patients, how many tubes are there, how big they are, because sometimes you need more manpower to make sure everything goes uh, very smooth. Um, usually, there is uh, one at the head of the bed that usually takes care of the patient head, neck, ET tube, and also the ventilator tubing, and he's the one that is the leader, kind of in a way and coordinate both timing and direction of the turning. So he's going to be counting one, two, three, and then we're going to flip. Or he's going to be also saying that we're going to flip as smooth as possible. Um, and then, how, you know, you need to have, you know, some people on either side and, um, you know, um, typically the one that we have at the head is usually the um, RT, the Fanny Tenefos. And on the sides is usually nurses. And one, um, 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 during the pandemic for New York, they did a prone team that was mobile and going between different hospitals and different ICUs. And they, the, um, they, the type of people that they use or staff were actually physical therapists and occupational therapists. And the reason is because they do work with critically ill people every day when you do early mobilization protocols. So they, you know, and those people, they probably were not doing a lot of things during the early stages of the pandemic. And therefore, they were used, uh, they were a very good resource to use on those kind of prone team that uh, one of the hospitals in New York used. Okay. So, um, these are two videos. So this one is from the New England Journal of Medicine. And this is the French group that I talked about. It, they do have an accent, so sometimes it may not, um, you, you, it may not be very, um, uh, you know, very understandable. This is from Rush University Medical Center. And this is actually a longer video. And it's actually, they use prone with five to six people. 
and this is a very good resource. And if we have time, I may show I may show some um, some parts of that video uh, later on during the uh, end of the lecture. But this is a very good resource. It talks in details about what to look for, how to do it, and at the same time, how to flip them back to supine. Because also flipping back to supine also need to be coordinated similar to what you do right now uh, when you when you try to prone them. But basically, the procedure itself, there is usually three steps. So one of them is, you know, على um, horizontal levels, بتزيح المريض كله والشيتس ل one side of the bed. The side of the bed بيعتمد على إنه شو direction تبع ال flipping. So أنت بالعادة بتزيحه مثلاً لليمين إذا بدك تعمل flipping على اليسار لأنه أنت أول ما تزيحه على جنب البيت next step إنك توقفه على جنبه. بعدين بتكمل فعشان هيك انت بتزيح المريض على الجهه اللي عكس انت بدك تعمل فليبنج سواء من يمين لشمال او من شمال لليمين بعدين لما توقف المريض على حرف على الجنب على الحرف يوجلي انه يو بليس التليمتري بادز يو ريموف ذيم فروم ذا تشيست لانه ما بدك اي بريشر سورز بعدين بتحطهم على الظهر لانه بدك تتاكد انه المريض ما صار عنده اي اريثمياز لحد يعني تستنى لحد ما المريض يصير برون وبعدين تحطهم ممكن المريض يصير عنده اريثمياز وانت مش عارف فهذا التايم اللي انت بتوقف المريض على حرفه الناس بحطوا مثلا البادز او التليمتري بادز على الـ او الباتشز على ظهر المريض وعلى نفس الوقت كمان بغيروا الشيت اند نيت ذا بيد وبعدين بتكمل انه سواء انت بتحطه برون بس الفاينل بوزيشن بيعتمد يو نو يوزلي الرايس بيكون يا من اليمين يا من الشمال تيبيكلي في المرضى اللي بيكونوا في سباين سيرجري بنحطه على زي جيل باد ويكون مطلع مثلا لتحت بس هون بالعاده المريض بيكون يا اما لليمين يا اما لشمال والارمز بيكون يا اما على السايدز او ون بوزيشن وي تراي كومنلي از بيسموه سويمينج بوزيشن سو ون ارم از اب ون ارم از داون اند ذن وانس يو تشينج ذيم يو موف ذا هيد تو ذا اذر سايد وبتغير البوزيشن تبع تبع الارمز بس في الفيديوز راح راح يكونوا توكينج ان ديتيلز عن الموضوع بعد ما تعمل بروننج Uh, واحدة من الشغلات المهمة إنه ABG because you want to check what happened to their PO2 at the same time what happened to their PSO2 so you want to make sure to make some adjustments and uh, one crucial part to this is you know repositioning you need to reposition them every two hours and you're gonna check for pressure areas every two hours also التقرحات الفراش and you need now before COVID we used to do frequent endotracheal suctioning. And the reason is, once you flip people prone, there will be more, um, uh, mo you know, prone tends to mobilize secretions anteriorly. And that sometimes, along if the patient is paralyzed, then you, he not, you're not going to be able to clearly uh, clear those secretions, and they may obstruct the ET um, um, tube. They may, you may start seeing that there is, um, you know, peak airway pressuring, uh, triggering all the vent. So, Ashan uh, Heka, Due to COVID, when any, any suctioning is considered an aerosol generating procedures, these day, you know, right now we just reserve this if the, someone breathing or desynchronizing with a vent or something like that. If the if it's disrupt if it's um, obstructed or if the critical uh, respiratory rate um, condition deserve that, um, but we don't do it routinely uh, uh, for those COVID nineteen patients because of the risk of aerosolization, and then. You're gonna continue the adequate um, sedation, and you don't need to be minus. Uh, you know, probably need to be at least minus five when you are prone because it's it's not comfortable. And uh, some people use paralytics. Um, some people don't. Uh, some people use it as a continuous infusion. Some people use it as a PRN. Uh, a lot of times, most people are leaning towards using paralytics for those patients, at least. Um, 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 you know, in um and then more of like IV PRN, just because, you know, you want to make sure that they're comfortable, you want to make sure that the patient is not struggling, and at the same time, there is some evidence, you know, though you may question that, of benefit in severe um, um, ARDS. In terms of enteral nutrition, uh, usually, you know, we do start enteral nutrition because اغلب المرضى اللي في سيفير كوفيد 19 ARDS, and even sometimes even COVID, even ARDS without that, بالعادة بعد على الفنتليتر at least four or five and for COVID-19 ممكن week or two and therefore you need internal nutrition so you cannot just leave them without it and um, 
you know, some people think that you cannot use enteral nutrition with people who are paralyzed. In fact, you can because paralytics will not work on the smooth muscles uh, of this of the peristalsis. Um, so at least like trickle tube fees is is we use them even when people are prone, even when they are on paralytics. And one position that we like to use is to do the whole bed in a reverse trendelenburg at least like 20 to 25 degrees. So you'll see the whole bed is like that. And the guide, the idea is like to prevent any um, aspiration or vomiting just because the patient is sleeping on their um, on their stomach. And some uh, some group they use prophylactic pro prokinetics just to kind of help mobilize and decrease the residuals in the um, in the stomach. But uh, it's not routinely that we do. But we typically routinely start in control nutrition and we do put them on a reverse Trendelenburg uh, kind of position where the head is higher than the um, uh, the feet. Dr. Ali, just to remind you, five more minutes. Sure, good. So, um, a practical tips about uh, about this. So, there is common complication, and this is what, how you look for it. So, um, um, brachial plexus injury or nerve compression, venous stasis, especially the face and the corneas, uh, ETT dislodgement, pressure sores, the rates are the same, but locations are different. So look for the face, anterior shoulders, knees, and uh, anterior chest. Vomiting, as we talked, and transient hemodynamic instability or hypoxemia. Now for this, how you know something uh, specific to COVID-19, so prone ventilation or proning is considered an AGP because there may be some disconnection of the vents inadvertently. So everyone in the room should be having full PPE. And Dr. Jamil talked about what full PPE mean, but everyone should be. And usually the physician who's taking care of the patient, we're not inside the room. With any AGP. We are fully donned with full PPE, and we're just waiting outside the door and ready to go in just if there is any, if the patient crashes before or after. So you are ready, but you don't need to be in the room because you want to minimize how many people are in the room. And one hot topic these days is awake or self proning. You know, there is initial case reports from Italy, from New York, and from other parts of the world where people usually encouraging, you know, the results are encouraging that people who prone while they are awake, they do better. But the problem that we that we face right now is most of that is what we call anecdotal evidence. So it's not studied in clinical study. It's not, we don't know if it does prevent intubation. We don't know if it's accelerate recovery. And we don't know if it's affect mortality. But it's achievable. It's not doesn't require a lot of things. But after the way, it's safe. What we find practically, it's a little bit difficult. It's not a a comfortable position to be in. Uh, we do also ask people who are on a high flow or a BiPAP to prone while they're awake. So doesn't, the fact that you are on a high flow or a BiPAP doesn't mean that you cannot do it. But most people usually likely are monitored very closely just because they're requiring more than just simple nasal cannula uh, of that. So this is kind of what we use as an inclusion. So basically anyone who's requiring oxygen in the hospital because of COVID-19 and has evidence of COVID-19 pneumonia by x-ray, then they need to be, or not need to be, there. they can, you can ask him. And as long as they're not in distress, and he needs something more, then you probably, you don't want to delay any intubation just because you're hoping that if you have him to sleep on his stomach, he will be doing better. Contraindication of proning, you don't ask him to do so. Uh, in studies that have been published is two hour sessions uh, at least like as tolerated and at least three to four times a day. And uh, initially, you probably have to have some close monitoring. Just make sure that the patient is getting better and, um, you know, avoid any day, uh, avoid any delaying intubation. When we stop prone ventilation, if the patient is prone, how if there is worsening clinical status? And one of the scores that we use is called RAC score. Now, one thing to think of is this is the ratio of the saturation over the FiO2 
over the respiratory rate. So it doesn't need any ABG or anything like that. But this has been studied in people who fail high flow nasal cannula. So we don't know if people fail BiPAP, this will apply. At the same time, you know, we're not aware if it's been validated in COVID-19. Now I work at Mayo and the group there, they did say that they validated it internally. So, but they didn't publish it yet. So as far as now, this is one of the best objective um, uh, tools to, pro to see who's getting worse. And usually, the, you know, there's different cutoffs based on the timing from the time that you start the high flow. But usually a usual number is around 4.8 A's is when you have to take a closer look at those patients and make sure that you're not, um, you're appropriately you know, keep, keeping a close eye on them. So in summary, uh, prone position, when used appropriately, improves mortality in ARDS. And when I'm saying appropriately severe, the yeah, average is less than 150. Early, within 48 hours of um, meeting those criteria that we talked about, and prolonged, which is at least for 16 hours per day. And it is labor intensive. It does require a coordinated effort among the staff. That's why we talk about the prone team and training. And you need to be vigilantly monitoring any potential complications. And in people with COVID-19, consider awake proning or self-proning uh, on those patients. And thank you.